you know, there's nothing that lights up an NFL game more than a great quarterback duel. Both of these quarterbacks were as good as advertised. The proverbial aerial circus, right? It was like two heavyweight fighters just throwing haymakers at each other. And when you talk about a duel like that, that's almost like a duel at the OK Corral. Some of the most memorable games in NFL history have featured two QBs battling it out, mano a mano. Two heavyweights going at it. Somebody gonna get knocked out today. Each of the shootouts that made our list may have its own unique flavor. Mark, could you use a hot dog with chili? Mark Sanchez is trying his best to hide a hot dog. But there are some standard ingredients required for a great quarterback duel. The recipe for brilliance is a lot of passing. Looks like we got a track meet going here. A lot of points, no defense. This kind of football game will put punters out of work. That's a game where you have bragging rights. You go home with Giselle, say, look here, baby, I'm the man. I kick Peyton Manning's ass. I think for a classic duel, first of all, you got to have a stakes game. It has to be minimum playoff game, preferably a championship game. No, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the postseason. It doesn't necessarily have to be two big-name guys. These are like Hall of Fame numbers for Quinn and Stafford. Woo! While no two duels may be exactly alike, each of the QB clashes that have made our countdown have one thing in common. Plenty of excitement when it mattered most. It's always the finish. It's the fourth quarter. You can take the first three quarters. You can take the yards. You can take the touchdowns and all that. And I, I could care less about that. I want to see two guys duking it out, and I want to see the guy who has the ball last win the game. To me, that's a great quarterback duel. The number 10 quarterback duel of all time. Jim Kelly versus Steve Young, 1992. Number 10. There is no way this should be number 10 on the list. I mean, I was there, and I'm still in awe with what I saw. 1,087 yards in offense. That would place it tied for third all time. Two of the great quarterbacks, right? Two Hall of Famers. Okay, let's start with that. And then two offenses that let them loose. The 49ers with their West Coast attack. Young wants to throw, goes to the right sideline. All alone, Turner should get in. Touchdown, 49. And the Bills with their K-Gun attack. Kelly to throw. He fires it. A wide open. Thurman Thomas. Touchdown. We're able to beat respective defenses that were good. This Buffalo defense has not played the way it normally can. Kelly and Young may have combined for an impressive 852 passing yards and six touchdowns. But the reason this QB duel made our list involves a first-ever goose egg in an NFL box score. What I remember is, is looking at the stat sheet afterwards and saying, did anybody punt in this game? Now he goes for the end zone! Touchdown for Buffalo! Metzelars again! Chris Moore and Klaus Wilmsmeyer did not step foot on the field. Oh, my! Neither team had to punt once. That shows you how effective the offensive were. No reason to have punters in a game where Jim Kelly and Steve Young are the quarterbacks. There's another requirement for a great quarterback duel. No punts. That's kind of the essence of perfection, like a baseball perfect game. In addition to punts, our number 10 duel was missing something else. Like the greatest receiver in NFL history. Wow. For Steve to put up that many yards without Jerry Rice in the game? Jerry Rice has not gotten up. Might have caught a knee in the helmet. Now it's just cracking into a whole new level of epicness. That was the game that Jerry Rice left early with a concussion. To think that that game happened without Jerry Rice is astounding when you look at the numbers. If that game had, you know, another quarter or two to it, it probably would have gone into the hundreds, and there still wouldn't have been a punt. 80 yards away from a touchdown, but a field goal would tie for Young. Like all the great duels on our list, this one also came down to the wire. So why is it ranked number 10? Because the outcome wasn't decided by a QB. Buffalo celebrates on the far side as Popper misses wide right. This 
probably a game we should revisit more on NFL Network. Let's put that on the classic rotation. I'd like to see that one uh, one Sunday night at about uh, you know one one in the morning. Crack open a beer and watch it. Coming up, getting into a duel with Peyton Manning is no easy task. Find out which quarterback tried to keep pace with Peyton. He comes back. He takes the lead. He does everything that you have to do. He looks. He's out playing Peyton. He outplayed Peyton Manning in that game. Uh, when you look at the numbers. When you're facing Peyton Manning, keeping up with him usually means getting into a quarterback duel, and there have been plenty throughout the years. Look, he's going to throw it down the middle, center for Reggie Wayne, touchdown! 36 yard touchdown pass. That was the right there, that was the reason right there! In 2004, Manning and Brett Favre went head-to-head, -head, throwing for a combined nine touchdowns and over 700 yards. 36 yard touchdown pass to match the Colts. Here's it out at Jennifer Stokely. He's got it. Touchdown! While Manning outdueled Favre, a few weeks later he found himself having to throw for 472 yards and five touchdowns against Trent Green and the Chiefs. <laughs> Although Green threw three touchdowns, including the game winner, Green over the middle, touchdown, Tony Gonzalez. This duel didn't make our list because he also relied on three touchdowns from his running back. But the other quarterback in our number nine duel was better at trying to match Manning. The number nine quarterback duel of all time, Peyton Manning versus Tony Romo in 2013. Oh, I remember that game. It went, it went bonkers, yeah. It was a back-and-forth game between the Cowboys and Broncos, and, and what a quarterback duel it was between Peyton Manning and Tony Romo. Amazing game. Shootout with Peyton Manning. Who would have thunk that Tony would keep up with Peyton? Here's a shovel pass. Julius Thomas catches it. Simple touchdown. Romo's going to throw a fade. Back shoulder. Touchdown. Peyton Manning's 2013 season is the greatest quarterback season of all time to date. He put up more yards, more touchdowns, and had a game like this, an incredible scintillating performance. Peyton looking right, throws right. Welker has a Denver touchdown. While Peyton's 2013 season was rare, in our number nine duel, Manning did something else uncommon. Oh. Manning with a play fake. Peyton Manning with a 7.57 second 40 goes untouched. All of a sudden, you see Peyton Manning holding up the ball in the end zone. Peyton Manning had not run for a touchdown in forever. Peyton Manning had the best supporting cast in the NFL at that point. Romo had no support. DeMarco Murray only ran for 43 yards. Romo got sacked four times with the Broncos' pass rush. Romo was out there practically by himself in that game. Romo is keeping plays alive for four and five seconds, spinning and finding a guy downfield. I mean, it was magical. Romo back and looking, and look at him running. Throws to win. Touchdown! He comes back. He takes the lead. He does everything that you have to do. He looks... He's out playing Peyton. They might as well just take both sets of linemen off the field because this is strictly a seven-on-seven -seven passing league right now. And it's Manning and Romo. And to this point, Romo has got the best of it. Boy, Tony Romo, you would have thought Tony Romo was stabbing his way to Canton, Ohio during that game. Quick screen, Beasley on the left side, touchdown! Then he went Romo on him. In classic dueling fashion, our number nine game came down to a last-minute throw. 48-48 here, a truly historic game. Snap to Romo, throws that pass, going to be intercepted! He threw for 500 yards, he threw for a number of touchdowns, the Cowboys should have won the game, and then at the very last second, he throws the interception that loses. So everything else is wiped away, right? This is the ultimate Romo game. The worst time it could come on what's been an otherwise magnificent afternoon for him. You know what the story will be? Romo can't handle it. Two things happen on that play that no one talks about. One is that the rookie tight end who he's targeting on the play runs a pretty bad route. And then the second thing is his offensive lineman is knocked back into him and he steps into his leg. But no one cares about that. All anyone cares about is the Tony Romo narrative that here we go, Tony Romo choked again. You can't help but feel bad for Tony Romo. You know, his best game ever as an NFL player comes against Peyton Manning who's just a little bit better and found a way to win that ball game. Denver is 5-0. You can't fault either of those quarterbacks. 51-48 game. you got to give credit to the quarterbacks for getting it done. I think this game could be higher if you really think about what it represented during that Super Bowl season for the Denver Broncos. This was one of the biggest tests that they had. 900 yards of offense from two guys that 
sit pretty high in the record books. It was a pretty special game to be at. The number eight quarterback duel of all time. Bledsoe and Marino's season opening shootout, 1994. That's a quarterback duel that we're talking about. 894 yards passing. It has been a spectacular show of aerial fireworks for both teams. He had two guys who could throw the ball about as well as you could throw it. You could easily make a case for that game being ranked higher than eight. Both of these quarterbacks were as good as advertised. Best game ever. Dan Marino's first game off the Achilles injury. Missed all the year the year before. Seeing him come back from an Achilles and put up a game like that doesn't surprise me. On a muddy field in the 1994 season opener, Marino faced doubts about his ability to rebound from that devastating injury, as well as an ascending AFC East rival. Bledsoe was absolutely positively the heir apparent. He performed so well at the end of his first year that people hoped he could somehow stand up against the Dolphins and Marino. My childhood heroes are still playing. Elway and Marino, and now I get out on the field, and, and instead of being my heroes now I just want to go kick their butts week one right away right out of the shoot boom Marino slogging in the mud back to pass he throws downfield has it at open Mark Ingram has it at the 30 he is gone Danny Marino is back baby Drew Bledsoe was matching the great Dan Marino at the peak of his powers completion for completion touchdown for touchdown fires it up the field Ben coach open 40 35 30 breaks the tackle touchdown that's the way to throw the ball, Drew. That's a perfect throw, son. And the momentum now belongs to the men in blue. Marino's greatest efforts were when the opposing quarterback also had a great effort. You think back to that Bledsoe game, and they're going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. He said, give me the rock. I got to keep going downfield. Marino to fire a touchdown Dolphins! That was just a <laughs> it was an epic game. You know, there's nothing that lights up an NFL game more than a great quarterback duel. After the fourth touchdown pass of the day for Bledsoe, New England goes back on top of Miami. But what will Marino do next? That should be number one on your list. You know why? Because on fourth and five, Dan Marino had the onions to go deep down the field. Trailing 35-32 late in the fourth quarter, Marino surprised just about everyone on the biggest play in our number eight duel. You've got to get it almost to the 30. To win the first one. Everybody, including the defense, expected us to go for the five yards to pick up the first down to maintain possession of the ball. To me, one of the one of the ballsy plays you'll ever see from a quarterback. Shotgun, Marino. Throws deep downfield. It is caught by Fryer. Yes! Touchdown, Dolphins! The fifth touchdown pass of the game for Dan Marino. Irving Fryer, touchdown. See you later. Dolphins win. You talk about championship courage. A flame burns inside that man, Dan Marino. It doesn't get any more entertaining than Brady versus Manning. It's better than Desperate Housewives. <laughs> Brady Manning to me is number one. You've got to have a Brady Manning game on the list. There's no question. Find out which one of their classic duels made the countdown next. It's the hallmark quarterback rivalry of this era. Tom Brady and Peyton Manning have squared off many times over the last decade, often with very memorable results. Take, for example, the fireworks in the 2004 season opener. Looks, floats, end zone, touchdown to Daniel Graham. The two future Hall of Famers combined for 591 yards and five touchdowns as Brady led the Patriots to the first of 14 victories in that championship season. The tables were turned two seasons later in the AFC title game. Peyton outpaced Brady in a dramatic comeback victory en route to winning his first Super Bowl. Got it! He got it! We're going to the Super Bowl! Those two Brady-Manning matchups may have been entertaining, but there was another duel in their rivalry more deserving of a spot on our list. The number seven quarterback duel of all time. The fourth and two game, 2009. Although they've met a lot of times during the course of their careers, it was the game where two of them were both playing at the highest level. Let's go earn it, fellas. Gotta go earn it today. 
There just isn't enough room to include all the great Brady versus Manning matchups over the years. No question, hands down the rivalry of the decade. So how did this duel make our list? It comes down to simple math. Both quarterbacks have never combined for as many yards or touchdowns than in that Week 10 game in 2009. You've got to have a Brady-Manning game on the list. In this game in 2009, they were both putting up great numbers, especially considering how good those defenses were. The number one scoring defense in the NFL is the Indianapolis Colts, and so far they've been getting scorched out here. Welcome back. Good shot, Thomas. Direction after Brady. Looks. Fires left. Touchdown, Randy Moss. Patriots 31, Indianapolis 14. Brady has always played well against the Colts. Brady is so good in the pocket, they don't get to him. If this were a heavyweight championship fight, I think they would be sending New England to a neutral corner right now to give Indy a break. The 2009 game had a different tenor than most of the Manning-Brady rivalry games. The script had flipped. Manning and Brady have had some great, great duels over the years. After Manning had a few tough games against the Patriots early in his career, he has pretty much, with consistency, ripped the Patriot defense apart. Now you need three scores in 14 minutes. Strips left, scrap left, soul train, alert, 13 trap, hold one. Manning deep down the sideline, and reaching for it, he first off for the touchdown. This game's picking up, isn't it? Oh, yeah. With a six-point lead and 2.08 remaining in the fourth quarter, even Bill Belichick got caught up in our number seven duel. And the Patriots are going to go for it on fourth down. I can't believe this. Brady throws it upfield. It is short of the first down. It is short. The Colts take over. We've never seen any coach bow to another quarterback like that. With New England, uh, you, you kind of expect uh, the unexpected. You could say that the game where Belichick went for it on fourth down ranks above the championship games because Belichick so feared Manning that he chose to do something that was considered almost insane. I think there'll be a few things to talk about after this game. Okay. Holy mackerel. The best part was the debate afterwards. The Aaron Schatzes and the Football Outsiders guys, they all came out of the woodwork of the basement, and they started saying, Advanced statistical analysis says that to go for it on fourth to two in that situation was the right play. While plenty of question marks surrounded Belichick's decision, Manning took the ball and put an exclamation point on our number seven duel. Manning looks for the quick throw. Throw to Reggie. Touchdown! Reggie Wayne! They win! 35-34. What better situation you want, baby? See Tom Brady lies in the draw. You don't get no better than that. It was one of the all-time great games. If you like quarterback slinging the ball all over the yard. Manning against Brady doesn't get any better than that. The number six quarterback duel of all time. Dickey and Theismann light up Monday night, 1983. This was a great one, 771 yards to the air. But how many football fans do you think if you polled would say, I remember where I was for Dickey Theismann? Nothing like being 15 years old without a driver's license, no girlfriend, nothing to do but stay at home on a Monday night and root for your Redskins. The legendary Curly Lambeau Field, a sellout crowd, 56,000 plus. Viewers who expected a blowout between the defending Super Bowl champs and a team with the NFL's worst defense were entertained by the highest scoring game in Monday night football history. Looks like we got a track meet going here. This kind of football game will put punters out of work. In terms of quarterback duels, I'm not sure Theismann versus Lynn Dickey is going to really tickle anyone's uh, excitement meter. But when it's the highest scoring Monday Night Football game of all time, you have to give that some respect. It was a great quarterback duel between Dickey and Joe Theismann, who was at that time one of the league's best quarterbacks. I'll tell you something, Joe Theismann, he is a spunky little guy. He'll talk your ear off. I would certainly rank it higher than six when it came to entertainment value, quality of play. I think America is loving this one. <laughs> I sure am. We felt like we could score a lot of points. We just didn't count on the other guys scoring quite that many. I was there. That's right. Nobody could stop anybody. Dickie is there. Six. Our secondary that year had a nickname, the Pearl Harbor Crew. Bombs away. 
They're not planning on running it in. That ball was thrown right on the money. Dickey is really sharp tonight. Lynn Dickey was one of those quarterbacks he sort of lost in, in football history. Would never be considered a great quarterback, but he could really throw it. The coaches had a meeting a little while ago, and they decided the first team to 50 wins. It became more and more obvious that we were going to have to figure out a way to match them point for point. Looking to take the lead once again in a seesaw battle. Nice by Mucky, comes into the end zone, touchdown Washington. We score a touchdown, I hold for the extra point, I come jogging to the sideline, reached over, grabbed a Gatorade, Russ Grimm walked up to me, he said, let's go. I said, we just scored. He said, so did they, let's go. Our number six duel saw five lead changes in the fourth quarter alone. Trailing by just a point with under a minute to play, Washington had a chance to go ahead for good. The Redskins would have won if Theismann had just gotten Mosley a little bit closer on that final drive. Being the holder for Mark, I knew exactly what his distances were. There's the shot that you waited for. That is Fired to Charlie Brown. Everything went according to plan, except we didn't make the field goal. Mosley misses the boy. And the Packers. Whoa. I always thought both quarterbacks should have retired after the game because it really wasn't going to get any better. Theismann already had his ring. He wasn't going to get another. And that was probably Lynn Dickey's finest moment as an NFL quarterback. Coming up, find out which two Hall of Famers duped it out in one of the game's greatest duels. That game really reminded me of Allie Frazier 3. It was like two heavyweight fighters just throwing haymakers at each other. Before we fight any more duels, Let's review our list so far. Number 10, Kelly K.O.'s Young. I was there, and I'm still in awe of what I saw. There is no way this should be number 10. Number 9, Tony Romo almost upsets Peyton Manning. Amazing game. Shoot out with Peyton Manning. Who would have thunk that Tony would keep up with Peyton? Number 8, Dan the Man tops can do Drew. 894 yards passing. That's a quarterback duel. Number 7, Brady versus Manny. It's the hallmark quarterback rivalry of this era. Doesn't get any better than that. Number six, Dickey outduels Theismann. The highest scoring Monday Night Football game of all time. You have to give that some respect. And now, the number five quarterback duel of all time. John Elway versus Bernie Kosar. The 1987 AFC Championship. It's unfortunate that this game is remembered by Ernest Biner's fumble because this was just a fun football game with two QBs slinging it all over the place. From Mile High Stadium, it's the rematch the Browns have long awaited. And there was a lot going on in that game. I mean, the bitter memory for the Browns of the previous year and Elway leading the drive. 98 and a half yard drive. The Browns felt that they were even better in 87 than they were in 86. Different venues. You, same quarterbacks. Bernie Kosar for the Browns, John Elway for the Broncos, for the right to go to the Super Bowl. There was a revenge factor. And if you want to talk about a team that was looking to right a wrong in their minds. Elway drops the throw for the first time, drills the pass. John Elway got the Broncos out of the gate fast. First with his arm, then his legs. The most important difference between these two teams was Elway's scrambling ability. Every time they seemed to get Denver stopped, there goes Elway, running with the football. John Elway made a ton of plays in that game in which he moved, including a very long touchdown pass to Mark Jackson, which I think was close to 90 yards. Jackson at the 25, breaks a tackle, gets out over the 30, the 35, gets a block from Sewell, and here he comes. The Broncos went ahead in that game 21 to 3. And in the second half, Bernie Kosar was so incredibly sharp throwing the football. He was so precise in that second half. Perfect touch of the football by Bernie Kosar. It was like watching Da Vinci paint something. Stroke by stroke, Bernie Kosar painted over the Denver defense for 356 passing yards. He was as accurate a long passer as I've ever seen. Once we started scoring in the second half, they couldn't stop us and we couldn't stop them. Bernie's back to throw, fires, touchdown, slaughter! The Browns have struggled back into an even Steven football game. John Elway showed you why he is John Elway. It was a great game with two quarterbacks having tremendous days. 
but it's hard to get past the fumble near the end of the game. Kosar hands off the Biner on a draw. Biner inside the five to the four to the three to the two. He fumbles the football in the front row cabin. This was just a goofy mistake. I mean, that was really a Rembrandt of a quarterback performance. If it wasn't for the fumble, we'd be talking about that game not only as a great quarterback duel, but as one of the greatest comebacks in NFL playoff history. The fact that this game ended with a fumble by a running back shouldn't affect the ranking and the performance of these quarterbacks. There was no loser in that game when it comes to quarterbacks. The number four quarterback duel of all time. Joe Namath clashes with Johnny Unitas, 1972. That game really reminded me of Ali Frazier 3 in Manila because Frazier and Ali both were thought to have seen their better days. I look at Namath Unitas kind of the same way. Anytime the two teams meet, the greatest interest has to be the anticipated duel of two pairs of shoes and the men who fill them. Unitas was in his last year at Baltimore. He finished that year, he only threw four touchdown passes that whole season. There doesn't seem to be any chance that he's gonna turn back the clock and have one of those Johnny Unitas days, but he does. Johnny Unitas completed 26 of 45 passes for 376 yards. That was his 27th 300-yard passing game. You say that today, seems so what? That was an NFL record at that point far and away. Namath was coming off two years where he had been injured, and people were starting to think that even though he was not an old player, he was certainly a declining player. Joe Namath riddled the Colts defense for nearly 500 yards and six touchdowns. Namath threw for 496, I think it was, and he only completed 15 passes. He was a mad bomber. 15 passes. 15, okay, for 496 yards. Now let that settle. I think you have to call that his greatest statistical performance ever. He threw touchdowns of 65, 79, and 82 yards. When you average it all out, his average attempt netted 33 yards. That's mad bombing. <laughs> there was still plenty of time for a Baltimore comeback, and come back they did. Unitas took to the air. It was almost like Johnny U reached down deep and came up one more time showing why he was the most respected quarterback at that point in history. As he expertly picked his spots and moved his team downfield, the grand old man had done it. The Colts were back in the game. Each guy pushed the bar up, and then the other guy would match it and push the bar up further. It was a beautiful thing to watch. Broadway Joe fired the final shot in this duel, hitting Rich Caster late in the fourth quarter to ice a 44-34 Jets win. When you talk about a duel like that, that's almost like a duel at the OK Corral. They had it out. Both he and Unitas had combined for 822 yards through the air, over one half mile. It was not a passing league back in 1972. We were not accustomed to watching quarterbacks just drop back and throw seemingly 70% of the snaps. The 1972 game in some ways could be brought out as a template for what the NFL has become, and this was 1972. Coming up, a Super Duel in the Super Bowl. Now we're getting into some real nitty-gritty here. This game was off the charts. When I think of the great quarterback duels, that one always, you know, jumps out at me. The Super Bowl has seen many great quarterback performances. Montana, steps up, throws. But relatively few great quarterback duels. Man, oh man. In fact, only one of the duels on our list occurred in the big game. But first, here's one that came close. Super Bowl 38. Brady and Jake DeLone. It seems like an odd thing to throw out there because obviously the difference between the two players is so great. But there was a stretch in that game where Jake DeLome is going toe to toe with Tom Brady. Together, Jake DeLome and Tom Brady threw for 649 yards. How about that? The highest combined total in Super Bowl history. Patriots take the lead. The Patriots staring him to throw, and he throws a perfect strike. Though Brady DeLome has yards, it lacks the legendary luster of our number three selection. Hey, did you expect anything else? The number three quarterback duel of all time. Bradshaw meets Staubach in Super Bowl 13.
You look back over the course of Super Bowls, you don't see too many times where quarterbacks get out there and just really duke it out. But on this day, that's pretty much the way it was. It was a remarkable clash of styles. Caught by Tony Hill at the 20, the 15, touchdown, Cowboys! Staubach was playing under the thumb of Tom Landry. Remember, Bradshaw was sort of a winging quarterback. In the highest scoring Super Bowl to that point, Terry Bradshaw threw for 318 yards and four touchdowns. He was as good a, a big game quarterback as there's ever been, right there with Bart Starr and the other guys. In the end zone, and it's caught for a touchdown. Terry Bradshaw on third down, eight of nine, including two touchdowns. That's clutch. Steelers had those great receivers. Cowboys really depended on Roger Staubach. Quarterback like Staubach doesn't know the meaning of the word quick. Quarterback like Bradshaw, well, there were a lot of words he didn't know the meaning of. Before the game, Cowboys linebacker Thomas Hollywood Henderson made headlines when he said... Terry Bradshaw couldn't spell cat if you spotted him the C and the A. Terry was not the kind of guy that was really affected by that kind of stuff. I, I, I really don't think that bothered him. Terry Bradshaw called all his own plays. Staubach had all of his plays sent in for him. Here's the guy who's thought of the dummy, and he's really running the offense. And the guy that everybody thinks of as the smart guy and the leader is actually the guy who's doing what the coach tells him to do. Terry Bradshaw ain't the sharpest knife in the drawer. Then again, he's made dumb into a millionaire business. Hard to beat. Hard to beat. The Hollywood Henderson thing, water up a duck's back. I'm in the talk show industry, so I know that an idiot babbling means nothing to intelligent people. And I'm not sure who I insulted when I said that. It might have been myself. You need some help to be a great quarterback, and I think we saw that in Super Bowl 13. It's third down and three, Dallas at the Pittsburgh 10. Roger Starback puts the ball right on the money in the end zone. Big tight end in the back of the end zone, Jackie Smith, and he drops it. <laughs> The difference in that quarterback duel was Jackie Smith dropping the pass. Oh, bless his heart. He's got to be the sickest man in America. If he catches that ball, there's one less Lombardi trophy in that trophy case over on the south side. With under seven minutes to play, the Steelers held an 18-point lead. To have that kind of lead, it should be game over. I mean, this is the steel curtain. The Steelers could not put this guy and this team away. Roger drops back, fires it out of the flat for Billy Joe Dupree to the five, and in for the touchdown. The Cowboys may still be alive. You're going, this can't happen. And it's another first down for the Cowboys. I'm starting to get a little nervous. This can't happen. Okay, here he is firing. Caught by Drew Pearson. This can't happen, can it? Isn't it amazing? This is not over yet. Roger is giving some kind of a performance. Drops back two steps, bumps once, goes deep in the end zone, caught touchdown. Wow, maybe it can. There was drama till the very end. 22 seconds on the clock. The Cowboys' remote chance for victory disappeared into the arms of Rocky Blyer. The quarterbacks beat the defenses that day. Didn't always happen in championship football. Some of these quarterbacks that may have competed in big-time quarterback duels, they may have choked like dogs in the Super Bowl. These two guys did not shrink in the moment. They rose to the occasion. Haven't been quarterback battles in a Super Bowl, and that one was probably the best we've ever had in the biggest game. I might put Staubach Bradshaw in Super Bowl 13, number one. To me, that's the most iconic Super Bowl of all time. Coming up, did we drop the ball on our number two selection? I would argue this game might be a little high. Who are the experts that make up the rules for these quarterback duels? Two gunfighters standing in the street and one gets hit by a bus. That's not a great duel. Take a peek at our list of the top quarterback duels of all time, and you'll find one iconic name missing. Who's that guy at the 19? What's the name of? Bandana. Uh, Montana. Montana? Yeah. The absence of Joe Montana in our countdown is bothersome to some. It, it, it doesn't bother me. It, it, it doesn't bother me. It, it, it doesn't bother me. Those of us who worship Joe Montana like to think that he stood alone. How can you have a duel when one guy is a god and the other man is a human? The number two quarterback duel of all time. Aaron Rodgers and Kurt Warner go wild in the 2009 wildcard game. It was a passing of the torch type of game. He had Warner 
who really, that was his last great game. And then you had Rodgers. You could see from that game, this is the next great quarterback in the NFL. Warner had just been in the Super Bowl. Rodgers would be getting there. That's kind of where their careers intersect. Kurt Warner was 29 of 33 for 379 yards and five touchdowns in that wild card game. It is 14 to nothing, Arizona. Five touchdowns, four incompletions. I don't know that there was a better game in his career. Packers had a pretty darn good defense, and he shredded them. He did that against Charles Woodson. He did that against Clay Matthews. That was an excellent defense that season. Warner's got time, steps up, throws over the middle. It's caught by Doucette at the 10, spins out of a tackle at the five, touchdown! To go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this rising star in Aaron Rodgers and emerge victorious. It is 31 to 10 Cardinals. In my mind, it sealed it for Kurt Warner as a Hall of Fame quarterback. I always wondered what type of quarterback Kurt could be if he could move. What would he look like? Well, he's in Green Bay. Same guy, same arm, same accuracy, except Aaron Rodgers has got the legs. It's almost the perfect quarterback. Rodgers looks, drills the right side of the end zone. Aaron Rodgers, to me, he's the finest thrower ever of the football, the most incredibly accurate with the most incredible velocity. Aaron Rodgers threw for 423 yards on the day and four touchdowns, all in an epic second-half comeback. It felt like the Cardinals were hopelessly ahead throughout the entire second half. Aaron Rodgers was just unstoppable. Tight roping to the sideline, Jordy Nelson to the pylon for the touchdown! And the Packers climb back into it, 31-24. In the fourth quarter, the Cardinals cannot stop the Packer offense! Rodgers and Warner matched each other nearly blow for blow. By the end of regulation, the game was dead even at 45 all. We're tied at 45. A minute gone by in overtime. The real irony of that game is that defense decided it. Oh, Rodgers dropping back in trouble. Rodgers hits the ball, came out. Cardinals have a day three. He's going to score. Oh, really, it was kind of the first time we even noticed that there was a defense involved in that game. The way it ended, that was like, that, that's all? We wanted more. That was a great game. Don't get me wrong. Those were unbelievable performances. But number two, I'm not sure. A great quarterback duel has to beat Roethlisberger hitting Holmes in the end zone. It's got to end that way to me. I mean, that's like having two gunfighters standing in the street and one gets hit by a bus. That's not a great duel. How that game ended, to me, doesn't take anything away from how well the two quarterbacks played. I'll go back to stakes. It's the playoffs. It's a young gun against an old gun. How can you not be fired up? They say this. They say this. It can't end in a defensive. I, I'd like to speak to the panel. I would I am the panel. I, yes, this should be number two. It deserves to be ranked, the, the, you know, as the second greatest quarterback duel of all time. And to me, it had to be a great contender for number one. Coming up, the grudge match that is number one. It became a personal battle, man, just between the two of them. Their duel was absolutely must-see TV. Before anyone gets hurt dueling, let's review our list so far. Number 10, the K-Gun outshoots the Young Gun. Did anybody punt in this game? Neither team had to punt once. Number 9, Manning edges, edges out, out Romo. But to have over 900 yards of offense between those quarterbacks, it was a pretty special game to be at. Number eight, Blazing Bledsoe and Marino Magic. You could easily make a case for that game being ranked higher than eight. Number seven, Brady Manning. Enough said. If you like quarterbacks slinging the ball, it was one of the all-time great games. Number six, Dickie Downs Theisman. It was a great quarterback duel. I remember where I was for Dickie Theisman. Number five. Elway and Kosar create a masterpiece. That was really a Rembrandt of a quarterback performance. Number four, a battle of legends. With Johnny U and Joe Namath, you mention those names today, they get respect. 
Number three, Bradshaw and Staubach bring it in the bowl. There have been quarterback battles in the Super Bowl, and that one was probably the best we've ever had. Number two, Rodgers and Warner wing it in the wild card. It deserves to be ranked as the second greatest quarterback duel of all time, and to me it had to be a great contender for number one. And now, the number one quarterback duel of all time. Ken O'Brien outguns Dan Marino, 1986. Squish defense. There's no rivalry that sickens me more than Dolphins Jets. I think the Jets fans' hatred for the Dolphins stems all to Dan Marino in the 1983 draft. They had a chance to get him. They took Kenny O'Brien. New York Jets take quarterback no. Ken O'Brien of California Davis. When the Jets drafted O'Brien, the fans that were at the draft in New York City, I thought they were going to tear the hotel down. The folks in New York are still saying, how could you take Kenny O'Brien when Dan Marino was there? Jets fans, they get left with Ken O'Brien. Dan Marino goes on to do Dan Marino things with his flowing locks and his cannon arm, and he's doing ads for totes. He's just everything that Jets fans aren't. He's literate, he's beautiful, he's smart, he's talented. Dan Marino is the anti-Jet fan. Kenny O'Brien was a real good NFL quarterback. He didn't deliver to the Jets what Marino did, except on this one fateful day. If you enjoy defense, please exit through the rear cabin immediately. The quarterback would just drop back, throw, and it was complete. O'Brien back to throw. O'Brien's got some time. You almost didn't even realize that defense was on the field. There was nobody within 20 yards of there was no sense at any point in that game that anybody was going to be stopped. Don Shula, get him some defense for God's sake. How do you score 45 points and don't win a game? You got to give credit for the quarterback. That's what they're paid to do for making it happen. Both were spectacular. A lot of big plays, a lot of long bombs that were thrown right on the money for touchdowns by both teams. If you're a defensive coach, you're in deep trouble. <laughs> I think both teams got a little shell shock because it was just up and down the field, up and down the field. What is this, pinball? And pretty soon you lose your confidence. It was who's going to have the ball last. With just over a minute to play, the Jets had the ball last, trailing by seven. What an unbelievable finish! But time was running out. Five seconds left in the game. O'Brien throwing over the middle. Wesley Walker, touchdown! Touchdown! good fortune continued in overtime. As soon as we won the coin toss, I knew we were going to score. Everything was going our way at that point. O'Brien's back to throw. O'Brien's throwing long down the sideline for Walker. And he got it. Touchdown. Wesley Walker with his fourth touchdown reception. The Jets are going to serve. And the Jets win it. 51 to 45. When you talk about quarterback duels, that's what you like to see. A lot of numbers and a lot of yards on the board. 884 passing yards, Dan Marino, Ken O'Brien. It was a truly remarkable shootout. Our number one selection has yards, but should it be a playoff game? No, it doesn't have to be a playoff game. Did it have yards? Did it have points? Did it have drama? Did it have cool uniforms? Yes, 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 and yes. Absolutely, this should be number one. I was there at that game, and I felt really good for Ken O'Brien. That game kind of put some credibility for the Jets taking Ken O'Brien number one. On that day, he got the better of Dan Marino. You really want me to back off my proclamation that this is the greatest quarterback duel of all time by throwing out there, really, Ken O'Brien, what was he? I am steadfast in my declaration. This is the greatest quarterback duel of all time. End of discussion. And yes, it included Ken O'Brien. I apologize, but that's NFL history. I can't change it.